Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Like I said, my name is Willie, and I am an alcoholic. And I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, you know, I was a little, I was a little bit nervous last night until that dance started, and then after I got out there and started dancing, I felt pretty good. You know, I was able to relieve a lot of tension and all that. But now again this morning, I was a little nervous too because I'm not normally used to getting up like this and speaking. You know, especially this is the first time with a mic and all that, and it's kind of a weird trip. <laughs> something different. Uh, our topic, uh, our deal on the thing says uh, most of us were unwilling, you know, and uh, I don't know really how I felt when I came to this program. All my feelings were anesthetized for so long that I really, I wasn't capable of feeling anything for myself or anybody else. Uh, I was incapable of loving anybody. I was incapable of being totally honest. I was incapable of a lot of things, but uh, I think all I wanted to do was get sober for a while, get dried out until I started feeling better, and then go out and start in again, you know. But after a couple of weeks, after my head began to clear a little bit, uh, it, came a, it became apparent to me through talking to a lot of people that cared about me and all that, that, uh, that I was an alcoholic, you know, and that I had a disease. And I always thought it was a weak character or a lack of willpower or something like that, you know. I just thought there was something wrong with me other than alcohol for a long time. Uh, I, I guess deep down inside of me, I knew I was an alcoholic, but I just wasn't willing to do anything about it. Who cares, you know? I sure don't care. Big deal, you know. But I guess it got to that point where it just got so out of hand for me that I was just unable to deal with it any longer. And uh, like I say, after a couple of weeks, the head started to clear. And then I knew I could remember the horrible things that I had done. I mean, my whole past became evident to me, you know, and I just didn't want to go back to that misery any longer. I had had enough when I got to this program, and I didn't have to go back out and try it anymore. You know, and they said, read the big book, and I read it, and I didn't understand a damn thing that I read. You know, work the steps. Well, what are the steps, you know? And uh, the guy that introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, he was a, a guy down in uh, Oakland Naval Hospital. I went to a treatment center down there. And he used to go to meetings, and he'd be sitting there, and all he would say is, my name's Steve, and I'm an alcoholic, and if you want what we have, read the big book. And that's all he'd say, you know, and I, I thought, well, this guy isn't very nice. You know, shit, he's not giving me very much sympathy, you know. And uh, eventually, though, the big book did begin to make sense. And I think it was only after I'd been around here for quite some time, probably about three or four months. And then it became, it, 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 I, I started to understand it a little bit, understand what they were talking about. Uh, a sponsorship is real important in my life today, and it was way back then, too, because I needed somebody. I I needed people to love me and to hug me and to show me what this big book was all about and to, to help me, you know. I had a lot of questions about this sobriety and, and AA and everything else. And uh, I didn't really like too many people when I came to this program. You know, me, I, I hated myself. Uh, and I didn't really like too many other people either. I had a lot of fear inside of me and a lot of guilt and a lot of loneliness. You know, I wanted people around, but yet I was so damn afraid of people, and, and, you know, I don't know, man. I was just screwed up when I got to this program. That's all I know. And uh, my life is good today. It's 100% better than it's ever been before. And I, I do think it's a re as a result of trying to work the program to the best of my ability, and the program, as far as I'm concerned, is the 12 steps in the big book, you know. And the people have been real important in my life. You know, I used to say I love Alcoholics Anonymous, but I don't love everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, what is Alcoholics Anonymous? It's a fellowship of men and women, you know. Uh, I don't know. The more I read out of the book, even today, the more things, that book seems to come alive. Uh, things that I've read probably a hundred times before and never understood or never thought, well, big deal, you know, this doesn't pertain to me. 
well, now it just flashes right between the eyes and hits me right between the eyes, and it makes sense. And I really understand what they're talking about. Uh, I'm going to let Phyllis get up here for a while and say a few words. Thanks. I'm Phyllis, and I'm a real alcoholic. <clears throat> uh, it's kind of a coincidence that uh, the theme of this meeting is most of us were unwilling, because that comes from Chapter 3 of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's how come I introduced myself as a real alcoholic, because there was a lot of years in my life that I would never, ever have ever admitted that I was in any way an alcoholic because my mother was an alcoholic, and that's one thing I was never going to be. <laughs> and she showed me how. And uh, my mother died the week before she was 56 years old with cirrhosis of the liver. And she didn't die drunk because she couldn't get a drink. And I'm sure right to the very end she wanted a drink, and she never believed him. And when she was dying, she showed typical alcoholic um, tendencies because she was still denying it. <clears throat> she laid there in the bed and wouldn't speak to us for about two weeks right after they told her she was going to die. <laughs> she was mad at us because she was going to die. <clears throat> and most of us were unwilling. Well, I was really unwilling. And uh, I got here because of an incident that happened in my life, like most of us. And I got fired from a job, and I saw it in writing. That's why I got, you know, it, it just took that. I've heard a lot of people since I've been here, and they said they got 20, 30 jobs they got fired from. I got fired from one. And it was in, writ in writing. It said that I was an alcoholic. <laughs> I didn't like that because I wasn't an alcoholic, you know. I was having a little trouble with drinking, you know. I showed up a few times at work a little uh, tipsy. But uh, I um. I wasn't going to be an alcoholic, you see. See, I didn't get up one bright, sunshiny morning and think, well, today I think I'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And I got here in a devious way because my ex-husband was in a treatment program in Vancouver, Washington, and I loved him. Shit, I went around for 13 years telling that guy I loved him. You know, he said, I don't love you. I love you. I don't love you. Let's get married or something. Okay, I'll marry you. So I married him twice. Yeah. I've been twice. <laughs> Yeah, you know, or divorced right now. <clears throat> I still see him once in a while. I saw him yesterday at a football game. We have a mutual child. And uh, he's still fighting and wrestling this uh, this program. He's been around here for about 30 years. But he gave me something very precious because he gave me this program. Three months into this program, we got married. We got married at the treatment center. <laughs> and I should have told me something, you know, in Vancouver, Washington, you know. And the people at our wedding were alcoholics. And right after the minister said, I now pronounce you man and wife, <laughs> this man went, Yoo-hoo! you know, I looked at him, I thought he'd gone crazy. And the minister said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And all these alcoholics stood up as we walked out, and they all said in unison, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And uh, I thought that was so neat, and I still do. And the marriage didn't work out, but you know, today that's all right wasn't then, <laughs> but it is now. And through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have discovered a new way of life. You know, when I sit down with that man and he tells me the way I am, he's wrong. You know, he told me yesterday, now I know what you do. You always have done this. And I said, hey, Jim, you don't know me. I've taken the steps. I'm different. I've changed. Now, I know that nobody changes. And I said, well, you haven't, but I have, you know. <laughs> and, uh, he just kind of shakes his head, and I'm not sure he'll ever believe it, but that's okay, you know. I've learned to live and let live. I've learned some of the things you people have taught me, not 100%, but I've learned it, you know. And the one thing I really have learned is that I am a real alcoholic. I was unwilling to admit that I was for a long, long time. But it, having been in writing and having come before you people and having known that I could not quit drinking, and then you told me how, just one day at a time. And somehow I could hear you. And the love that came from you, I never had that kind of love before. If I was a good girl, people would love me, maybe. You know, until I was a bad girl again, and I always ended up being a bad girl. 
There are always conditions on all the love I got. Now, this particular conference is a very important conference to me because, you see, after nine months, my husband left me. And that was in June. And in August, I broke my leg. And then in September, there was the first Young People's Conference. I think it was either September or October, the first one. And it, <clears throat> I didn't know a thing about conferences, and they said it was a big party, and that sounded good to me. And so <laughs> this friend and I went over to this conference, and we had never been in such a big place before, sober, either one of us. And I was over a year old at the time, you know. <laughs> and I walked in, and I didn't know any of these funny people. <laughs> They were all young, and I was old, you know, and I thought, oh, wow, you know. They said, hi, who are you? And I said, I'm Phyllis, you know, and I was shaking, and they said, well, welcome, come on in. And the theme of that particular spiritual breakfast that particular year was, you touched me, and I grew, and you did, and I did, and I'll never forget it. And there's some people in this room that were at that breakfast. And perhaps it's the single most moving meeting I've ever been to. It was so beautiful. And these people, hundreds of, I, I, almost a hundred got up and told why they were thankful for Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, it was, it was just something I'd never experienced before. All these beautiful people so happy, so early in the morning, you know. <laughs> and, and the spiritual feeling. Because you see, when I got here, I hated God. He had done me in. And for almost two years on this program, I used to grit my teeth when I prayed, you know. Like, let God help me. One of my friends said to me, uh, Phyllis, when you talk to God, unclench your teeth, you know. <laughs> but you know, I found a higher power. And I'll tell you a strange story about my higher power. When I first got here, I couldn't believe in that dude up there, whoever he was, because, you see, he'd done me, and he'd taken my husband, and, and in this church I went to in Hammond, everybody traded husbands and wives, and, you know, and it was kind of, you know, loose, <laughs> to say the least, and I got chipped out of a man, and that maybe made me the maddest, you know. My husband went with my best friend, and my best friend's husband went with my other best friend, and the other best friend's husband went to Alaska, see, <laughs> so I didn't get one. So I got left alone with the kids, too, you know. And uh, so that was what God did to me. And I figured any dude to do that to a nice person like me wasn't a very good guy, and I didn't want too much to do with him. See. So they told me I had to find a higher power, and they told me I could use anything, a teacup. That didn't sound very good. I didn't like tea. Uh, they told me I could use a fence post. I never knew a fence post I liked. But I did know something that was more powerful than me. Because, you see, I lived by the sea for a lot of years. And so every time that they'd tell me I had to believe in a higher power, I believed in the ocean. Now, this might sound really crazy to you, but you see, it worked. It worked. Because I knew that dude could knock me down, and it was big, you know. I'd been across it six months old, and I went to Hawaii, sober, you know. And so I knew it was a big one. So I just said, okay, ocean, you know. Okay, okay, Pacific. And it worked. You know, and then I just believed that until I could believe something better. And I looked, and I looked, and I looked. <laughs> and you know, finally I found God in the last place I looked. <laughs> right inside of me. Never knew he was there. <laughs> it was me. And Alcoholics Anonymous is a beautiful program. It, it saved my life, you see, so of course I love it. And I love everybody in this room. Now, some people, when I say that, say, oh, wow, she's a nut. But you see, I do. And I don't have to cop out so much. It used to be a cop out. I'd say, well, I love everybody in this room as much as I'm capable of loving you today. Because there's always a few people I was kind of questioning. But you see, the people that are on this program, I listen to you and you tell me who you are. And you tell me how you do it. And you tell me how you hurt. And I watch people, you know, grow on this program and grow and grow. You know, the first time I ever met Willie, he was in a meeting and, <laughs> you know, he looked so lost and lonely and I went over and he reminded me so much of my oldest son. I thought, man, that could be David. David's got big guys like that. And David's about that age. That could be my oldest son and my oldest son lives in Texas. So I went over and I welcomed Willie and I said, gee, I'm glad you're here. You know, we really need you. <laughs> and he responded because he could feel that I really meant it and I did. 
And, you know, about a year later, he met my son. <laughs> they don't look alike. <laughs> I was really surprised when I saw them standing together. Willie's bigger than my son. <laughs> but it was neat. And I've just gotten so much. I I just can't ever pay back, you know. But I'm thankful. And I have a real attitude of gratitude. That's something that the people around the tables at Alcoholics Anonymous taught me. And, you know, the one thing I'm going to say before I... You want me to call on someone? Okay. The one, per, the, the one thing I want to say before I call on someone is that I have a real bad character defect. And you might have noticed this meeting started a little late. Well, I'm living up to my old reputation of being the late Mrs. T, <laughs> you know. And that is a character defect. But this morning I had a wonderful meeting at my house. Because a friend of mine from Alcoholics Anonymous hired my young son, and he came over this morning, and we talked about the traditions this morning. And it was neat, you know. And so I guess he always says, this particular friend of mine, that we're always right on time, that we always get where we're supposed to be just when we're supposed to. Something comforting in that. Maybe that's a cop-out, too, and maybe I'll grow out of that one, I hope. There's a lot of people in this room that mean a whole lot to me. There's one man, and I don't know him very well, but I've heard him a few times. And he's a super guy. He's one of the guys that was at that breakfast. And I'd like to hear from Bud this morning, Bud. He's got, got a catch in your getting along? <laughs> We're supposed to fill in the spaces on all the taping. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. My name is Bud. Oh, yeah, that I could have passed, right? Instead, instead of limping all the way up here, that's what you call going to any lengths. Um, the uh, the theme for this morning's uh, meeting is one that's that is close to me, as uh, Phyllis mentioned, that it's close to her, and that is because the third uh, chapter was, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous was where it began to happen for me. Uh, I'm, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous in Southern California in uh, 1965, if you're interested, if there's anybody here from California. Uh, yeah, uh, if you if you are, we can get together after the meeting and cut up touches, and find out who's still sober and who isn't, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, I used to laugh when I, in Southern California they read Chapter Three quite often, uh, almost as often as they do Chapter Five, uh, and they do a lot of reading down there. And. Uh, I used to laugh when they when they get to the part. Uh, these are the things that we tried, and I I tried them all, and then some. I tried a number of uh, what I thought was very very special ways uh, that absolutely conclusively proved that I was not had a non addictive personality, and therefore was non alcoholic. And uh, I took every test in the world, and uh, uh, and and came out you know, tested myself, and came out of course non alcoholic. And uh, and so so I really identified when I heard that, uh, but uh, I'm not saying I was the most unwilling uh, person that ever came to uh, to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I'm among the top ten, I'll bet you. Uh, and I got here, there was a a whole lot of. Uh, Deception in my in the reasons that I came to Alcoholics Anonymous it had to do with with getting a girlfriend back and uh, had to do with with recognizing that uh, materially things weren't going too well in my life and uh, and uh, and that drinking might have something to do with that and so when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous I did not make a commitment to um, to sobriety, last thing in the world I wanted was a lifetime of sobriety. Um, I could see that possibly six months uh, of not drinking at all. Uh, there was one concession that I had made before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was 
I knew pretty much that if I did drink, uh, that it was going to go out of control, or would quite likely go out of control. One of the one of the things that um, that chapter three helped me see clearly was that the number of times that that it did not go out of control, and that I that I was able to to drink almost socially and not get in a lot of trouble and uh, do all of the appropriate things and be appropriately funny and appropriately um, uh, social and uh, and do all of the, the proper things uh, whilst drinking, they were very, very important to me. Those, those things were very, very important to me because those were the times that I remembered. Uh, those were the times I could recall when I began to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with myself about my life's problem. The things I could not recall uh, were the more recent disasters. Uh, I could get I could get out of Los Angeles County Jail, and, uh, and, and never having gone to jail, I've been to jail many, many times, and never been to jail for any reason other than an alcohol-related, alcohol or drug-related offense. Usually, the, usually the crime was committed whilst under the influence. Not always, but it was always alcohol related. Always had something to do with drinking or with drugs. And I'd get out of the jail, walk directly across the street to the first bar to ponder my life's problem, right? To figure out what my life's problem was all about. Why is it I keep going back to jail? Uh, and, and at those times, I could always conjure up the, the times that uh, that had gone on in my life where I had gotten away with it, apparently gotten away with it. So they were very, very important. And uh, and when he said in chapter 3 that that uh, all of us at times thought we were, felt that we were regaining control, and such intervals were usually brief, but were followed always by still worse relapse, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And I finally had to see that where I was uh, and when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was really a mess, and I, and I came in and I said, here it is, and if I can make it six months, I'll, you know, I'll be able to straighten it up, and these people have an answer. I know that they know, that they need to know, uh, they know what I need to know, and they are, I believe them. I believe they're staying sober, and I believe they had a, had a drinking problem, and I'll use this thing to stay sober six months and uh, and get get it together and go on down the road and be the kind of swinger that I always knew I could be, right? And uh, and I got trapped. I <laughs> got trapped in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, because uh, I could see that 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 my definition of being, you know, after I got after I was sober about 90 days, I looked in the mirror and I said, yeah, I was right. Yeah, I was slightly indisposed. Rather than being at the at the place that they talked about, which was pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, and after I'd been around for a while and heard enough stories and talked to enough people, I could accept that hey, you know, who are you trying to kid? That's exactly where you were. There wasn't anybody in the world more pitiful. Uh, really had no place to turn, or I would not have come to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, in 1965, I was 30 years old. Uh, 30 year old folks were not coming to Alcoholics Anonymous in those days. Not very many of them. Uh, when I took a look at, at where it was I had walked into, and the place looked like, uh, it looked like a temple, you know, and the people looked like the carriage tray to me from where I came from, and, uh, and they were skid roaders, you know. Uh, those folks were last gaspers, and there wasn't anybody as young as I was. So, uh, I began to have a, have a clear picture because of, of the description of the alcoholic, of what they talk about in more about alcoholism, because of what's written in the big book. I began to, to get a clear picture of what I looked at. Also, as, as, uh, has been mentioned here, the people that got me willing to take a look at me were those in Alcoholics Anonymous who were willing to risk, uh, telling me exactly who I was, you know. Uh, I didn't always say, I, I remember one old guy, uh, he's a Gene, Gene E. from Southern California, who was the 28th member of Alcoholics Anonymous, was there when I got there, and he used to, uh, uh, he used to listen to me, so I get up to the podium and he listened to me talk, and I, and I had a terrible time with language, had an awful time with language, so I get up to the podium and I talk like I did in a, you know, in a bar room or in an alley, and, and I used a lot of four-letter words, and 
And uh, I would get down from the podium and uh, from get away from the lectern down from the podium and walk down the aisle, and Gene would get me off to the corner, and he'd start to tell me about my language and about what effect that would have in an open meeting on somebody's mother that came to see what Alcoholics Anonymous was about and on his wife that, you know, and, and how he would appreciate it if I left, uh, if I demonstrated that I uh, had some respect for what you people are doing here by leaving that kind of language where it belongs, okay? And I'd say something to him like, well, you wet-brained old son of a bitch, you know, uh, and he'd say, preface that with sober, if you please, and and go on with telling me about uh, uh, about where I was wrong. And uh, so I began to appreciate that. It, it usually took me a week or so before I could come back and say, all right, Gene, you were right. And that was usually because I was hurting. A great, usually, it was always because I was hurting a great deal because of our because of of the impact that the conversation made when I finally got my ego out of it enough that I could allow it to come through. And then I'd go back to Gene and say, okay, you were right. And I will make an attempt to clean up that part of what's going on in my life. And I will, I'll try not to offend you. And so a number of changes went on in my, went on in my life, uh, as a result of the people that, uh, that impacted me in the first, uh, couple of years and, uh, and have continued to go on for a little over 13 and a half years. And I'm very, very grateful that uh, uh, that you were all here or that there was somebody in those rooms uh, when I got here. And I'm glad that I was finally able to see, although I was extremely unwilling in the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bud. Uh, we have an announcement here. John Hughes, Visa credit card lost Friday night. It can be picked up at the hotel desk. That's John Hughes. Uh, there's one more announcement they wanted us to make, too, that the hospitality room is open, and also there's a room down the room from the hospitality room, and there'll be meetings going on 24 hours a day for whoever wants to get it going and all that. So... Uh, that's what's going on right now. Uh, you know, I think, I think basically what I've received the most out of this program is not looking for anything, not looking to receive anything, but, but being able to give of myself totally to other people, you know. Uh, I really believe what they say now when they're talking about we have to be rid of self totally. We have to be able to get out of self. And that way we can do work for other people, you know, and I can love and, and care for you people. And this has been very important to me, and, and uh, as a result of trying to get out of self to the to the maximum, I've been able to receive so much inside, you know. And, and when I got here, yeah, I wanted to stay sober, but I wasn't looking for anything else. I was looking for a way not to drink booze anymore. I'd had it with the alcohol, you know. And I found a way not to drink booze anymore, but I didn't think I was going to receive so many things that I have received on this program. You know, like the peace of mind and the comfort and the inner joy and the ability to deal with problems that cope in my, that come up in my life today. I never had that capacity before, you know, and it's just a real good feeling. Uh, I'd like to hear from the gentleman in the back there with the blue uh, sports coat on. He's wearing glasses. I'm Gene and I'm an alcoholic. The theme on most of us were unwilling. Remember when I first came to AA in Grants Pass? I didn't mind being an alcoholic. I sort of, 20 years ago, I figured I was an alcoholic. But I was a controlled alcoholic. I maintained. But I had a big fear. And my fear was becoming a lush. I didn't want to be a lush, whatever happened. And I was becoming a lush. And that's what brought me to AA. I didn't stop drinking right away. It 
because I was always afraid I might have a few more drinks that I could take, and I didn't want to stop too quick. I was sort of like the kid who's Mother told him that if you don't quit playing with yourself, you're going to go blind. And he looked at her and he said, well, can I keep on doing it till I need bifocals? And that's about where I was at. Till I finally realized that, hell, I was past the bifocal stage. This conference has been pretty important for me. I've only been going to conferences now for about the last year. And at every one, I learned quite a bit. At the state conference, there was a beautiful al lady. And she talked about things that reminded me of what went on in my home and what I felt when I was a kid 30 years ago, 35 years ago. And I didn't understand them then, but now I do understand them. Last night at the meeting, I heard young people talk. And things that I had buried for 20 years come out. I can't grow today unless I know where I came from. And so much in my past life I've got buried so deep that I need people to dig it out for me because I can't do it myself. I have to come to these meetings and I'm very, very grateful that you people are having this conference here. I'm really thankful that I can be here. Thank you. I am... I thank you too, Jane. I saw you down in, in uh, Albany. That was uh, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Tell us to live one day at a time, you know, and I'm looking forward to 1980. <laughs> you know? I told my my friend that works for the credit union that I was going to start taking $5 a month out of my <clears throat> wages this month. And she said, what for? And I said, well, because in 1980, I think I'm going to New Orleans. She said, 1980? <laughs> Five dollars a month, I'm not going to make it to New Orleans, but at least it's a start. And see, that's something that I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, that I can do things, I can plan ahead, but I don't plan the results. And always before, you know, I was always looking and looking and looking and planning ahead. Either I was living way, way in the tomorrows, or I was living way back there in the miseries, you know. God, he left me, and I'm alone, and whoa, whoa, whoa. And I tell you people, I can come to t- and tell you the saddest thing in the whole world, and it's all you do is go, oh. And somehow there's a lot of strength in that, oh, you know, because I know that even though you're kidding, that you really care. And uh, it's that kind of love that me. There's a young man that I haven't known very long, and today he's an animal. Today he's a gopher. <laughs> I'd love to hear him talk. Would you like to say a few words there? <laughs> Hi, my name's Jed, and I'm a, a drug abuser and an alcoholic. I, uh, I'm today's my two month birthday, or I've just been born for two months, and uh, I, uh, I've. Really, this last week, uh, I just got on the committee about, uh, I think it was three weeks ago. I, I'd been to two committee meetings and uh, really didn't know a lot of what was going on. I knew that this was like uh, Phyllis said, a big party, but I was just going to come and see what it was all about. I uh, This last week was really uh, uh, inspiring for me. I, uh, I've been on two months, and uh, I didn't still kind of scatterbrained and don't know what's going on uh but I'm trying really hard to to follow the steps and follow my feelings and how I how I believe uh a week ago yeah it was a, a week ago I uh 
I said to myself, I said, I don't need a, uh, it's, it's, it's not for me. Uh, it's stupid. I don't need it. And during the, uh, course of that week, uh, I started getting bad habits come back. Uh, like, uh, every once in a while I'd flip off somebody that was coming out of the, uh, this corner and cut in front of me or, uh, or I, somebody cut in front of me on the freeway while I was driving and, I just, that's not necessary, you know, I i didn't see any point in it, and that was the way I used to be, kind of obnoxious and loud, and, uh, so I i saw some of those bad habits coming back, and I saw maybe, I, I didn't slip, and I didn't drink, uh, I thought maybe I just didn't feel good, and, uh, I talked to my sponsor, and, uh, God talked to me, and I, I just decided this first part of the week, and I went back to a few meetings, and I really felt good, and I think that now I can really say that this is for me, uh, I'm going to live it day to day, uh, I'm going to be here however long it's going to take me to be here, I guess, uh, thank you, Phyllis, Willie. Uh. Thank you. There's a Narcotics Anonymous meeting at 11.30 a.m. in the Lewis and Clark room that's on the second floor, and everybody's welcome to attend. You know, I grew up with alcoholism in the family, and uh, when I got to this program, well, I think that's one of the reasons I knew deep down inside of me that I was an alcoholic because I grew up with it in my family and I saw it and I had become the person that I, you know, that I, that I grew up with in my life. And I think that's why I knew that I was an alcoholic. Uh, you know, I came to the program and I was here about a year and, uh, my dad had seen the change that came over me as a result of this program and, uh, and he got real sick and, I took him to the hospital, and when he got out, I took him to a meeting, and he's been in AA ever since, and I'd like to call on him now. Wayne? All right. If he wasn't so big, I'd spank him. <laughs> I think maybe looking at the problem of alcoholism, that that might be the uh, base cause. Uh, when I grew up, I was never spanked, and, and at home, uh, Willie here was never spanked, so maybe that's uh, uh, the lack of discipline might have led us into a drinking problem. I haven't learned much here so far this morning about alcoholism, but the gentleman back there that talked about the, uh, the bifocals, I had my glasses changed there this summer, and they gave me trifocals. So I... Uh, <laughs> I wondered about the, the unwillingness to quit drinking. It puzzles me because of all the problems it causes and the, the sickness that people are so unwilling to face it. At my age, that I was willing to accept that I had a drinking problem. It took me all these years, and I was proud that, that Willie was able to recognize his problem at, at his age and uh, do something about it. It took me so many years to, to, uh, to work at this. But I, I learned from that dentist last night. He, he said the, the intelligence factor of an alcoholic is supposed to be above average, and yet uh, when you look at the, the ridiculous situations and the poison you put in your system, he can't be that intelligent. There's something wrong there. And the second point that I thought he made that I, I enjoyed last night was until you accept step one, there's no way that you're going to work at the problem. And that's what I could never accept was step one. You can spend all the money you want to spend and on treatment programs or go to the head shrinkers or whatever, but until you accept number one, uh, then it's going to be a lost cause. Because I've, I've tried some of those, and some of them are ridiculous programs, and, uh, and, they're, and they're expensive. I went through an aversion treatment program one time. Uh, it was based on pure and simple sickness and throwing up, and they give you a big hypo on the rear end to close off the entrance into your stomach uh, so the alcohol wouldn't seep through and they set you in a big chair in front of a mirror and this hypo makes you deathly sick besides 
closing off the entrance into your uh, stomach where you could absorb the alcohol, it makes you deathly sick. And then you sit there and see yourself in this mirror, and you got a big throw-up basin, and they pour all this booze into you. It's all warm. And they concentrate on what you drink. Well, what did you drink, Wayne? Well, I was a vodka drinker. So I now get everything else from tequila to everything you can be sick. And then you sit there and see yourself in this mirror, and you got a big throw-up basin, and they pour all this booze into you. It's all warm. And they concentrate on what you drink. Well, what did you drink, Wayne? Well, I was a vodka drinker. So I now get everything else from tequila to everything you can think of, but always some more vodka than warm beer, then glasses of hot water. And uh, you go through this every day. And uh, I thought, my God, they're, they're killing me. I said, what the, uh, why should I go through something like this? And then my, my stomach uh, blood vessels ruptured. And I start throwing up blood. Well, we let you rest today. And then I get Maalox. I'd sit there in bed and drink this Maalox until I get my stomach cold enough and go back in the treatment room. And this this was an expensive treatment, I thought. And this was 10 years ago. And I still didn't learn. And why I was unwilling to accept it, I still don't know. And this is the basic problem of, of number one. I wouldn't accept that fact. And um, whatever that experience you need, I'm not sure yet. In my own case, uh, it was Willie being in the house as an example. And my guilt feeling of, of drinking when he was there, and the last drinking bout I had was the end of April. And then I think, too, that when I when he took me to the hospital, my doctor was so disgusted, he, he, he threw up his hands and said, hey, hey, and, and he kind of insulted me, and I think along with, with that factor and with uh, Willie being in the, in the house, uh, he's been a year out of the Navy and uh, was living at home and going to school. And I had this horrible guilt feeling, and I'd leave early in the morning. And I never left the house when I was drinking ordinarily. I would always drink in the house because I didn't want to get in the car. I was a pretty well-organized drinker. I'd get good supplies in, and then I would stay in the house. And I'd have my bottles in different places of the house. I never had to reach very far. I had one beside the bed, one in the bathroom, one in the kitchen. And I'd buy plenty at a time. I had an arrangement with a liquor store dealer that I could always write a check. And I knew how much a case cost. I'd get two or three cases, and if I could give him a check. And I wanted that all arranged ahead of time when I drank. And um, But this time, this last time, I, di I didn't do this. I'd get, I wanted to get out of the house, get away from Willie, so he wouldn't see me. And my daughter stops by daily. She works in uh, the east side of Portland, and she lives out in the farm area, but she'd stop by our house as headquarters. I didn't want Sue to see me. <clears throat> I didn't want Willie to see me, so I got in the car. And, and I always had alcohol in the car, and I'd go places, and, and uh, in this case, I got a, a, a ticket. I got stopped first time, and then I uh, the stomach went bad again, and acute gastritis, and Willie took me up to the hospital, and we talked my way up, and uh, and when we when I got out of the hospital, and, and I knew then that I had to, to get serious about not drinking, so I started the meetings and, and the, got into the program and the steps, so it made a logical... Uh, program in my mind in the in the program of number two was tough for me too. I didn't accept number one finally. Number two, not to turn my life over to a higher power. I couldn't see this. A stubborn, cynical son of a gun. Number one was bad enough. Me, powerless over alcohol, I won't accept that, damn it. I can quit drinking if I want to, anytime I want to, but that, yet I knew I couldn't. And then to turn around and say that Wayne had to turn his life over to higher power, I, I wouldn't want to accept, I couldn't accept that for a while. But I'm, I'm moving along in the steps, and it is a growth program. And I can see it's a slow and gradual growth program, and, and uh, but it's logical, it's, it's structured, and I like that. And I've had a change of attitude. Now I count my blessings every day. I used to be always cynical. I, I think the government stinks, and uh, the politicians are all crooked, and the, the engineers don't set the street lights right for me, because when I get up there, the, they always turn yellow. So there's something matter with the engineer's timing. And all this kind of an attitude, you see, I had to change. And even when I was a kid, I went to church, you know. This is back during the Depression. I, used to, I, I grew up in a Methodist family, and I'd sit there and look at these poor people. What kind of crap is this? Because they're going to get the good life after they die. I said, that doesn't make sense to me. So I, I always had this cynical attitude about the church, about the spiritual side, about society in general, and, and I've had to retone myself. So now each day, I know I can't take a drink. I'm not going to take a drink. 
and that I have to look at the bright side of things and count my blessings, and I do that every day, count your blessings. If I have a bad experience, by golly, I've learned something from that experience. Count your blessings, Wayne. Look what happened to Willie. Fine young man. Uh, handsome young man, just like his father. And uh, and he's got a good future ahead of him. And he grasped this thing at a young enough age that he can do something about it. And it took me all these years, I'll be 59 in December, and to, to get a hold of myself to, uh, to accept a program that, that, that makes sense and that can uh, do me a lot of good. I'm in good shape now. I was all bloated up and I'd drink, I'd go weeks. One night I went on a drunk, but I got out of that drunk beard. I had athlete's feet, that's infection of the feet, that didn't bathe. I had pink eye, I went to the doctor with that. I, I said, pink eye, hell, little kids get that. He said, hell, you've your face in the last three or four weeks. And I hadn't. I often thought there's one thing that might cure an alcoholic besides some other experience in AA would be to have a hidden camera in the room and take pictures of yourself. That I've looked in that mirror many a time, and these eyes were bugging out of my head, and I was a filthy, rotten mess. But there been a camera in that house, and then it rerun it for me. I think maybe I look back, <laughs> that might have straightened me out. But we didn't have a hidden camera. My wife has never picked on me as a drinking man. As a matter of fact, she's been an awful terrific help. We've been married since March 24th of 1942. I remember that because we turned 24 around to make it 42, and the month was March. So I can only remember it that way. See. But uh, she's always been a big help to me. On She never picked on me. Maybe she should have. I don't know. But uh, I'd go through these stages. And then when I'd sober up, when I'm Johnny on the spot. But when I went on those sprees, and uh, I just Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing, you people are aware of that because you've probably done the same thing. But it's the willingness now to accept that I've got through, I'm on step four, and this one scared the hell out of me too, about writing down things about myself. And I never thought you'd put anything on paper unless you went to a lawyer. Some guy says, well, if you write it down and hide it in the trunk of your car. I thought, what, what if I get, what if I get in a wreck? <laughs> out of the trunk of the car. That wouldn't be too good either. Well, thank you for listening to me and, uh, thanks, uh, Willie. <laughs> you sure don't have any problem getting up here talking, do you? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, it always gives me a great deal of joy when someone's mother or father comes to this program because of my mother, you know. I always wish kind of in back in my heart, you know, real deep down that my mother could have grasped this program. And I'd like to share with you just something that happened to me. I have a real good friend. The first amends I ever tried to make was to this friend. And uh, he lives in Seattle now, and I was really, a, he was one of my last companions. <laughs> you know, he's the one I hit on both ends of his head, you know. <clears throat> hit, hit him on the forehead, and he bled, you know. <laughs> and he said, but Phyllis, all I ever tried to do is love you. <laughs> and he turned over, and when he did, I hit him in the back, and I said, please from both ends, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and I, I was nice. <laughs> you know, people love me, you know, they, the terror of limp, you know. You know where Lentz is? Oh, yeah. Sometime on one of these badges, I'm going to fill his tea from Lentz. You know, where's Lentz? Ah, some people know, you know. I went through Lentz on my way home last night, and he was still there, you know. There was old Saki standing on the corner, you know, and here's this man running after this girl, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, it's only 1.30, you know, give him another hour, you know. <laughs> I don't belong in Lentz anymore. I'm really glad about that. Anyway, I called this guy up, you know, to tell him I was... I was sorry. I didn't know exactly how I was going to tell him because I didn't know exactly what I could do, but I knew I had to tell him. And so I said, Sanford, this is Phyllis. And he said, well, hi there. How are you, babe? And he said, where are you? <laughs> He's always open. I'm not in Seattle. <laughs> and I said, I'm home. And I said, I just called up to uh, try to um, tell you that I'm sorry. And he said to me, how long have you been on the program? <laughs> And I said, um, how did you know? Are you a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? And he said, no, not yet, but my mother was for 20 years. And, it, you know, it really hit home. You know, it just really hit me right in the gut because I realized that, you see, a complete psychic change does take place on this program. It has to. And we have to cease fighting everybody and everything. And you have to practice, you know. And I don't do it good yet, 
but I do it as good as I can this day. And I'm really thankful for the changes in my life. And it has changed. I wouldn't have to hit anybody today. You know, even no matter what they said. And I don't have to drink over anybody, any place, or anything. Now, something very strange happened in my life a couple weeks ago. And it was really, it was a hard thing to go through. But I didn't have to drink. And you know, I didn't even think about drinking. And that's gross for me. And this morning I was sitting up here and I was under a lot of stress because I was late and I didn't know I was going to co-chair this meeting and I felt embarrassed. And I, I thought, you know, this is exactly the kind of situation that I used to drink under or over or by, you know, because I was uncomfortable with Philip. And you see, when you start talking about it, then it dispels those feelings and the honesty. Now, there was a song this winter, and it said the honesty, sometimes when we touch, the honesty is too much. That's how kind of I feel about Alcoholics Anonymous sometimes. It just gets to be just so much, you know. God is so present. And, you know, he is a friend of mine today. My alcoholism got me here, and it was because of it that I learned to live one day at a time. And through the steps, you know, Wayne said he's on four. Four was like pulling my own teeth, and I don't have any. You know, it was it was tough, you know. Man, now, you know, I can remember going through four, you know. Five was a lark, you know, and what do you do with the thing? You know, I didn't want to lay it down. I was afraid somebody would read it, you know. Who? And I, I had a hard time reading it myself. Now, it occurs to me that we haven't called on a woman yet. And, you know, I know what happens when you have a meeting and you don't call on a woman. My God, everybody just goes, yeah, you know. And there are lots of really neat women in here. You know, I'm looking around and I think, I'd like to hear from her, and I'd like to hear from her, and I'd like to hear from her, and I'd like to hear from her. Any, meeny, you know, my father told me to call on Phyllis from Hollywood. Oh, you know, I want to tell you about the Phyllises. You know, when I first got here, <laughs> you know, there was another Phyllis on the program, you know, and she had really fuzzy hair, and she's cute as hell, you know, and everybody would say, they called her Little Phyllis. You know what that left me? <laughs> so I said, why do they call her Little Phyllis? Well, because she's little. And I said, well, we could call her Young Phyllis. Well, you know what that left me. <laughs> you know? So one time I found out, you know, if there's another Phyllis on the program, and they call her Phyllis from Hollywood. <laughs> you know what they called me behind my back and sometimes through my face? They called me Crazy Phyllis. <laughs> <laughs> I am Phyllis from Hollywood, <laughs> an alcoholic. Um, I wasn't expecting this. I was sitting back there thinking how close uh, Phyllis and my stories are uh, about our mothers. I came into AA the day we buried my mother. Uh, she was 72, and uh, no, no chance of her ever thinking about quitting drinking. Uh, and I grew up in an alcoholic family. And I was unwilling, very unwilling. I uh, fought it for a long time. I know I called my brother in California every time I had a few drinks, and it usually was 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I'd give him all this feel about how bad things were and, and uh, what I needed and, and uh, why weren't all these good things happening to me. And uh, he was very calm. I'd cuss him a lot. And very calm, and he'd just say, uh, why don't you call AA? Well, I'd call AA right after I hung up from him, and nobody would come out. And I did this about three times. And uh, I thought, well, the hell with these people. If they don't want to come out when I need them, who needs it, you know? And uh, so finally, uh, I started doing a lot of praying because I was a, a lonely drinker, uh, not right at first. I did a lot of partying, a lot of raising hell, and uh, like a marriage, I had uh, I was married to an alcoholic for 13 years and took all the beating, and then he left me for a younger chick and uh, left me with three kids, and then I turned around and married another alcoholic, and that lasted two months uh, because he went to bed, and I thought, you know, uh, by then I started feeling this. My God, you're a failure at everything you do. 
And so then I started the suicide trip, you know. Uh, it, I'm, the world would be better off without me. Uh, of course, I didn't realize how I was hurting my kids. They have never said that my drinking was a problem. They've, they've always said, Mom, we just hated it when you tried to commit suicide. That scared us because we loved you and we didn't want you to go. And uh, so anyway, uh, the day we buried my mother, my brother came up from California, and I, all I said was help. I didn't know I had an alcoholic problem. I knew I drank a lot, but I just felt like uh, these, all these other problems would go away, you know. Uh, when I read the Who Me, and uh, I listened to those people, I had a feeling that uh, this is where I belong. These people were what I was looking for all my life. Uh, they understood me. They understood where I was at. Uh, and I didn't have to drink again. I believed everything they told me. Uh, my God, I just jammed everything I could get down me, all the literature, all the big book, uh, you know, just everything. And uh, I just grasped this right, right from the very beginning. And, and it said it was a selfish program. And I felt, okay, I'm going to be selfish. I uh, moved out of a big house that I was living in because I had a house full of kids and their friends, and it was constant turmoil all the time. So I moved into a one-room apartment, and I figured, now this way, those kids would have to move out on their own and because uh, there was no room for them. And this was my program, and I was going to work it into hell with anything else. Hell with those kids, everything. It was that selfish for me. I knew I, I had to do this thing for me. And uh, little by little, I sent the children back to their dad. They weren't children. They were pretty far up in their teens. And, uh, but they were into the drugs and alcohol and staying out all night and raising a bunch of hell. And they were, they were threatening my sobriety because I was getting upset. And, uh, so I just sent them away. But, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I know I was unwilling, but boy, I'll tell you, uh, somebody mentioned pity here. Um, and if you want pity, you have to look in the dictionary. You're not going to get it here. Uh, I just went through a siege in the hospital where I went through a stage of pity. And I had a dear and loving friend who's sitting in the back of the room call me. And tried to straighten me out on it, and I rebelled. And uh, I have since become aware of what he was trying to do for me. That pity is not what I needed at that time. I needed a lot of fight and a lot of courage and a lot of faith in God to get up out of that hospital bed and, and be able to walk again. And uh, I love him dearly. And I know now what he was trying to do. Everybody in this program that tells me something, I've got to listen. Got to start listening. Um, it's a growing program for me, and it's, I'm a slow learner. And things are revealed even today that I never realized that I had done or, or uh, things that are possible in your life. And, uh, to me, this is just, oh, I don't know. I am so elated this morning to be here because I missed the last year at Young People's Conference, too. I was in the hospital. But I got to listen to the tape, and, uh, it's a thrill. It's just a thrill to be here today. Uh, I love every one of you. And, uh, when I need a spanking now and then or a talking to, I hope you'll give it to me. And I hope I can listen and take it. Thank you. I'd like to call on Kenny now. Uh, I don't think he realizes it, but he's done a lot for me. I've heard a lot of things he said at AA meetings that have really hit home to me. Come on up, Kenny. I don't know if I said it, but this meeting is being taped, and 
If you want to get a tape, you can talk to Vern after the meeting. Good evening. Good morning. Everyone, I'm glad to be here. I'm not entitled to be up here today. I'm not going to say much because I do have a privilege of conducting a meeting at 3 o'clock this afternoon. What they call the old timers getting together. And uh, I'd like to take this time to say I'm Kenny. I'm an alcoholic. And I have two unexpected friends that I am greatly admired to have with me this morning. And uh, by surprises like we get, their gifts and their beautiful gifts. And I'd like for Pat and Glenn from Lethbridge, Canada, to stand up here in the background. <laughs> through my trip through Canada and my stupid alcoholic uh, movement of program or the AA movement I drilled up in there. I didn't accidentally run into these people. They're both uh, with us and they're real fine people for the program and, and they call last night while I happened to be out and celebrate my birthday. It was my belly button birthday and so we had, uh, I just wanted to let them know that and uh, we had the privilege of having breakfast and talking over things. You get around me, they do they do the listening and I do the talking most of the time. Uh, I'd like to say this, I'm not going to talk long. If I started in, maybe some of you would get bored and maybe some of you would want to hear me longer. It's nice to be able to share. It's nice to be able to care. Because in the long run, it means to one thing, love. Love for your fellow man that you never knew before. It don't make any difference which language, which way you move your tongue. It is the action that you put behind yourself. Lifting yourself up to God and to your fellow man to make this fellowship stronger and better each day. Because remember, there's going to be somebody, maybe accidentally and maybe on purpose, Step through the doors of AA to watch your words just as well as someone gave you theirs. So never forget that you are on guard at your middle door at all times to be able to deliver what you receive. If you can't deliver, there's a book called Alcoholics Anonymous that you can read. It'll damn well show you how you can talk if you don't know how. Thank you a lot. Yeah, I was at a meeting that Kenny chaired yesterday, uh, and I can remember when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, Kenny used to be at a lot of meetings, and he'd stand up and he'd quote pages in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I thought, oh boy, if I ever could stay here that long, so I'd know what was on what page of that big book, you know. Boy, that'd be really neat. <laughs> he still does it. He did it yesterday, and I went home and read page 52. And uh, <laughs> I love him. You know, he's, he helped me a lot. He helped save my life. And I'd like to call him, Kenny and Pat. We have a few minutes left, and I think that would be really neat to come up and share. <laughs> yeah, here she comes, all the way from Canada, huh? That's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pat, and I am an alcoholic. Wow. <laughs> this is unexpected. Um, oh, thank you. This is so unexpected, I don't know if I can really say anything. Um, I've been in the program for three years now. In fact, uh, September is my AA birthday, and I won't be in Lethbridge to celebrate it. Um, it's our birthday meeting for the uh, last Saturday of each month. Um, well, I'll just say a little bit of how it was with me. I had a rough time with booze. I was, uh, I had the influence of booze in my life, my entire life. Uh, my father 
certainly indulged. Uh, so um, I suppose it was natural, uh, you know, to partake. But I didn't really have a real problem with booze until roughly uh, 10 years ago. And that's when loneliness and self-pity and resentment hit me like it, like it should, I guess. And um, I turned to booze. And um, I had a um, a good, I'd say a real good experience, uh, good enough to want to do something about it. Uh, my husband came into the AA program roughly three more uh, three months before I did, and um, we decided that I should give it a whirl too because it was interfering with my life, whether I was drinking it or whether he was or whoever it was, it was interfering in my life. And um, I wasn't sure I was an alcoholic either uh, when I first came in. But I did hang around and I listened to a lot of stories. And the part I like is, you know, if you're willing to become honest, I always used to think I was an honest person. But down deep, I guess I wasn't because uh, the program showed me how to be honest, or I'm beginning to become honest, as they have for years. And um, the part I think that stuck me the best in the uh, big book was um, alcohol is but a symptom, and the real problem was me. And this is this is where I started to grow, when I accepted that part, because I was going around in circles, um, not understanding too much, listening a lot, but still not associating uh, the whole thing, and um, when you know that I was the problem. So really, I think uh, that's how I started to work the program: is seeing me as the problem, and alcohol was but a symptom. And uh, I guess each one of us has to start somewhere, but that's how it fitted me. We have uh, gone to a lot of conventions. Uh, we go to meetings almost every night of the week. We have uh, happened there in Lethbridge at the Chapter House. And I hope that should any of you ever come out to Lethbridge, really, make that one of your first stops. Because it's a beautiful place to go. Uh, we have some wonderful people like all over. Um, in our travels, we've uh, met some wonderful, wonderful AA people. I can't imagine life without AA anymore. Um, because... I think after three years of it, I think, you know, you're, someone mentioned something about being reborn, eh, reborn two months or something. Well, it's pretty nice when you can say you've been reborn three years and, and, uh, you know, there is no end of this beautiful feeling. Anyhow, I think I've talked long enough. I didn't think I could go this far. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I want to call on one other person before we close the meeting. This guy come in at AA, and I met him up at the URS club, and uh, he told me that he was a 150-pound raving maniac when he got to AA. And after hearing his story, I have a tendency to believe it, you know. Uh, how about Butch? I, I want to share just one thing with you. You know, this lady said she was three. Well, I'm three, too, you know. And I have a little granddaughter that is six weeks younger than me. And on my third birthday, she gave me a third birthday card. And it's not too many grandmas that get a little birthday card that says, Happy Birthday, three-year-old, from this three-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> Would she? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I just got here. <laughs> You know, sometimes I wish them so-called normies would take a drink. <laughs> they could come here and learn how to live. I've been messing around with a transmission shop for about two months now, and uh, I already paid them for the work. <laughs> and it's still not done, but that's mine. Neither here nor there. I'm Butch, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm Butch. And a drug abuser and a people abuser. I abuse everything that made me feel good, because it felt so rotten. And I uh, felt rotten long before I found alcohol. When I found alcohol, I didn't feel rotten anymore. And through alcohol, I found a lot of other things. I found women, wine, and fast cars. 
and made me feel good. See my T-shirt? A lot of truth to that. <laughs> I got this way from kissing women. <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> as many as I could get my hands on. I was obsessed with them. And drugs. And money, of course, because you had to have money when you had obsessions like I had. <laughs> I did everything to make me feel good. So that's self-centered. And so I had all the qualifications when I got to Alcoholics Mom. Of course, I wasn't aware of them. <laughs> I didn't know why people rejected me. And they hurt me. And I hated them. And it was the story of my life. When I got here, I was full of hate. There wasn't any room for anything else. And boy, I hated it. <laughs> people were kind of afraid of me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but there were four or five that hung around the club that recognized the hate I had in me. And they loved me in spite of me. You know, I, did, I hated all men and loved all the ladies. <laughs> you know, I was here last night and there was a gal up here at the podium and I was a year sober. I went to hug her and she ducked. <laughs> I don't know what my face said. It took me a long time to develop that look. You know, my biker friends had it and it took me a while to develop it. And it took me a while on the program to get rid of it. You know, I didn't know I was crazy when I got here, you know. I came, and for a year, I, I went to meetings, and I didn't drink and drug. And that's all I could do. And I was still kicking down doors and beating the hell out of my old lady. You know, and I remember one night, Sunday night at the URS club, or Sunday morning, I sat there in that meeting, and my old lady sat beside me, and her eyeball looked like hamburger. And I said, my God, I'm crazy drunk or sober. And I took the second step. And you know, I haven't been violent since. Fantastic. I hated God when I got here being a Southern Baptist <laughs> as an eight year old and I was guilty way back then I hadn't done that. <clears throat> they said that going to shows and dancing was gonna die and go to hell to do them things and I like doing them. But through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous I've come to know a loving and forgiving father. And when the time came for me to take that third step I could take it. Because he had to be loving and forgiving in my case. Because I was an animal. <laughs> and it took another 13 months for me to get ready to take a fourth. You know, I never had anything. And, uh, so I had to have something. And so I put a life together. You know, I started a business that I never had. And I bought a home that I never had. And I had a wife and two cars and all the things. In my mind's eye, that made you happy. And I was miserable. <laughs> so I made a trip over to Crooked River to see a person that I respect and love very much on the program. And he said, well, you're a procrastinator. And I said, well, how can you say that? Look at all the things I've done. <laughs> all the things I've done. <clears throat> Story of my life. <clears throat> I came back and mulled that around for two weeks, and finally I realized he said I was procrastinating on the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it became time for me to take a fourth. And I had to take a fourth or to get drunk or go crazy. And I had to find out why Butch was a loser all his life. You know, and I did. An amazing thing about that fourth step, as I began to write, I began to see how my life evolved, how it came about, why I made the decisions I made based on what character defect, self-centeredness being the root of it, you know, lack of power, that was my dilemma, I wanted to be God, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course I'm not God, and, uh, you know, it wasn't too many relationships in the fourth step that uh, i seen the circle. I've seen why people rejected me and hurt me, and then I hated them for it. And I forgive them. And as I forgave them, something happened inside of me, and I don't hate anymore. That's what the four step did for me. It also showed that I couldn't have done anything else, because I didn't know any other way. If I could have done better, I'd have done better. 
You know, I didn't ask to be born into alcohol. I was raised in violence. I didn't know anything else. I needed that. I had to be who I was to survive, to get to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's fantastic. The sixth or the fifth step was made very easy for me. Uh, <laughs> I walked into the club and there's this fellow there, an old timer. He'd motioned me over at the table and I'd written all day. And he began to talk. And it was as though he had writ stood over my shoulder and read what I'd written during the day. And I said, yeah, how do you know that? <laughs> and he was talking about himself. Fantastic. Three days after the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh step, I had a spiritual awakening as a result of those steps in a bathroom over at this friend of mine's house. And my cup has run over ever since. The program works. Thank you. Thanks, Butch. Uh, I want to announce the next meeting starts at 1 o'clock, so we have time to eat lunch or whatever we want to do. And if we want to continue with meetings, remember that on the second floor in the Lewis and Clark room that we can start meetings up there anytime, 24 hours a day. Uh, I want to thank everybody for letting me share the meeting, and I want to thank everybody for sharing today. Uh, I really got a lot out of it, and now I'm going to let Phyllis say something before we close. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed being part of this meeting, too. And this is, as I told you, you know, this conference is a really special conference to me because it was the first party that I ever went to sober. And uh, I, I took two days off work, you know. <laughs> the people at my job said, what are you going to do on your vacation, so I said, I'm going to a party. <laughs> they all know I don't drink. You know? <laughs> I was like, what kind of party you're going to, you know. And I said, I'm going to the Columbia River Young People's Roundup. And they said that most of the people, because of the job that I have, is the same job. My father let me keep my job. See, that's the job I lost when I came here. And he let me keep my job. See, because my father always loved me. See, my father never did leave me. I left him. And you see, he never did let me down. And he today is doing for me what I have never been able to do for myself. My life is good today. Today my father gives me everything I need. Not everything I want, but that's coming. You know, I looked around. I did a little inventory about a week ago, you know. And I said, gee, I still got the same kids I had when I got here. At the same house, ostensibly. I got the same car, and it's worse than it used to be. Got the, I got a little different furniture, but it's still crappy. The dryer gave out, and it's the same dryer I got when I got, and I still had that one when I got here, too. I got everything that's pretty much the same. And then I looked in the mirror, and hey, there have been some changes, baby. I'm not the same person that came here. And, you know, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a young man that stayed at my house. You know, I heard a lady say last night she had a half-ass, halfway house. Well, so do I. And there have been a lot of alcoholics that have stayed at my house. And uh, it's been neat because they each one have taught me something. And we've touched each other's lives, you know, and it's neat. And there was a young man that stayed at my house, and he's a potential one of us. <laughs> and uh, he's a neat guy. And one morning, we AA'd, AA'd, we played the tapes, we AA'd, we AA'd, we played the tapes, we AA'd, we AA'd, we played the tapes. And these kids were going crazy, and they were saying, because the bedroom was in the house, and they were always hearing it, AA, AA, AA. And all of a sudden, one morning, he woke up, and he was listening. And Butchie was there, and I was there, and Ray was there, and we were all talking, alcoholics, not alcoholics, not the first step, the second step, the third step, on, on, on. <laughs> and he woke up and he said, Phyllis? And I said, yeah. Mom? Said, yeah, I'm here. And he said, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and that's become a byword in my house. When all else fails, we just yell. <laughs> I think all my neighbors know. <laughs> but it's okay, you see. Today it's okay. And I, I love alcoholics. And I, 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.